Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where we are here with, of course, the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. And it continues to be all Intel all the time. Well, kind of. It's not all Intel today, but we do have a fair bit of Intel news to kick things off. And we're going to begin with, you guessed it, the 9900K. As a leaked image has appeared online of the packaging for the ninth generation. And then you might just be going... Packaging? Why do I care about packaging? Well, basically we have a Twitter user by the name of Momomo who has leaked this, so thanks very much to them. The link to their Twitter post is in the description below this video. And when you look at it, you can kind of see why I'm bringing this to your attention. Because uh, it's a touch unusual, to say the least, because not only is it semi-transparent, it's also a dodecahedron, which is uh, different, to say the least. Like, normally it's, it's just a box, obviously. Now the Amazon listing that Momomo has posted doesn't actually state it is a 99, sorry, the 9900K, but the specs pretty much confirm it, even if the name isn't actually there. So yeah, they've they've they've, they've got a bit extra with the packaging this time around. Now you'll have undoubtedly noted the price tag on this Amazon listing as well, which is $582.50. So almost $600 for the 9900K, assuming it is, which. It pretty much is, as I said, judging by the specs. So, yeah. A little, a little on the high side, to say the least. But we have yet some more Intel news today, and we actually have some stuff from the HEDT platform. And what we have here is a report, thanks to the sources of PCBuildersClub.com, and their source is obviously anonymous, but is a source at a major manufacturer. And according to them, at least, the HEDT platform from Intel is going to be split into two, into the Z399 and X599 platforms. Now, apparently, these chips are now ready for production. New chipsets, should I say, rather, and isn't going to be for Cascade Lake yet. Unfortunately, it is just going to be for a Skylake X refresh. But basically what we are saying is a new socket for the Z399, the LGA2066, and the X599 with a LGA3647 chipset, or powering that chipset, should I say. Now, obviously, the X399 is being taken up by, well, Threadripper, if nothing else, so obviously that is probably partially why Intel have had to make this decision, go through Z399, and then, of course, X599, just get by X499 as well. But we are only going to be seeing, as I already said, a Skylake X refresh for this with up to 22 cores. And further, according to the sources of PC Builders Club, we are going to be seeing the Skylake X refresh launching this autumn. So it might even be this month, October. I know it feels weird that it's October already, but uh, somehow it is. Regrettably, we basically know nothing about the feature set of the Z399, we just know the core count of 22 cores, and the fact that it is obviously taking aim at the 32 core Threadripper, the 2990WX. But, obviously, that's a 32 core, and we're seeing a 22 core here. The real answer from Intel to Threadripper 2 is, of course, going to be Cascade Lake X, which is going to be scheduled to start in 2019. Now, obviously, the main question we are going to need to answer from Intel here is what is actually going to differentiate the two boards here? You know, again, Z39, X59, what are we actually going to see feature-wise on one that isn't on the other? Are we going to see an MLPCIE lanes on one? Are we going to see a specification towards a certain thing on one board, that sort of stuff is one going to be cheaper, lower power perhaps. Obviously we are going to have to wait and see on this one, but this is something they're going to have to do. And really this is just like them going, okay, here's what we have for now until Cascade Lake X comes out and obviously taking up the spots that Threadripper hasn't already gobbled up with its naming conventions. As I've discussed many times, the HEDT market, and of course the server market beyond that, is one of the most profitable areas in the PC space, as it were. So Intel is, of course, very eager to answer Threadripper 2, which has pretty much obliterated Basin Falls. But enough about this, we're going to talk about Intel adding Vulkan support next. So what we have here is the first patches with Vulkan support being added to Intel's open source CV library. So this is used for a bunch of real-time applications and of course comes with optimizations for not only, not only excuse me, Intel processors, but multi-core x86 in general. So 
Essentially what this means in real world terms is that people can move their neural network workloads to the GPU compute without having to rewrite their code. Long story short, it seems Intel have definitely enjoyed their visit to GPU land and has found a love for GPU accelerated compute. Now obviously, the choice of Vulkan as an API is very, very interesting, is available on a bunch of platforms, and I'm sure Intel are very, very aware that, you know, NVIDIA have a huge head start on them in terms of this particular area. They obviously have CUDA, and I'll be very, very curious to see what Vulkan could actually be capable of with the full force of Intel support behind it. That could be very, very interesting indeed. Of course, a lot of this is pure speculation, but it could be very interesting indeed. And I'm curious to see the impact that this will have on their GPU development for Arctic Sound and, of course, any future GPUs they may decide to do. But according to the source code changes for this, this is a quote, just a beginning work for Vulkan and OpenCV DNN. More layer types will be supported and performance tuning is on the way. So this is just a sort of first salvo, as it were, for this particular thing. But it is still cool to see nonetheless and an interesting choice from Intel to go with Vulkan as an API. But not really all that surprising, in all honesty, just interesting. So, speaking of NVIDIA, we're actually going to move away from Intel, finally, as we have some news regarding the Quadro cards. Now, I doubt many of you are looking to buy a Quadro card anytime soon, but it is still worth bringing it up, I feel, as the RTX 6000 and RTX 5000 graphics cards are now available for pre-order on the website. And the reason that most of you are probably going to be like, oh, oh no, is, well, the price, unsurprisingly, as the 6000 is priced at, well, $6,300. And the 5000 series, even though it's a bit more manageable, is still $2,500. In terms of the specs, however, we see the T102 silicon being used for the 6000 to its full potential with 4,608 CUDA cores, 576 tensor cores, 72 RT cores, and 24 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. And this is across a 384-bit memory bus. As for the 5000, it is on the TU-104 silicon with 3,072 CUDA cores, 384 tensor cores, 448 RT cores, and 16 gigabytes of GDDR6. Now, you may be kind of tipping your head a little bit and going, hang on, wasn't there one more card in the Quadro lineup? Yes, there was, the RTX 8000, which were... It's not available for pre-order yet because you're probably going to need to brace yourselves a little bit and uh, it would run you $10,000 if it was available and uh, it comes with 48 gigs of memory, which is uh, pretty much insane. So, yeah, not exactly consumer level, but still cool to see nonetheless them out in the wild. And a full example of the Turing architecture and what it is actually capable of, at least in its current form. So we're going to finish things up today with a brief comment from Sony's Sean Layden. So you may have heard that after quite some time of pressure from gamers, developers, publishers, and obviously their competitors as well, Sony has finally caved on their decision to not allow crossplay with other consoles. So I'm not talking PC and PS4 here because that was already a thing, but PC with Nintendo Switch and Xbox One and so on and so forth. And this is going to be beginning with Fortnite, the game that arguably started this whole thing. Now, this was taking place during a PlayStation blogcast episode where he discussed numerous things, but he did also bring to the spotlight the cross-play topic. So... Here's what you had to say, quote, this is something that's probably taken 65% of my Twitter feed over the last few months. Like I said, in Game Lab Barcelona this June, this is something we know, this is a want, this is a desire, and we want to be able to del deliver that in the best way possible. Now, enabling crossplay isn't just about flipping a switch and there you go. It's a very multi-dimensional kind of attribute or feature. So we have to look at it from a technical point of view. We have to work with our partners from a business point of view. We have to make sure that if we enable this, do we have the right customer service support? Do we have the right messaging out there? Do we have all these different things that you have to get in line? It's rather ordinal. They have to go in a certain order to set them all up. That's why, though it's taken us longer than certainly I would have wanted, but it took as long as it was going to take to get it ready and get it done, which is why we're not able to, we're not able to not only announce it on this past Tuesday, but also enable it at the same time. So far, so good. I haven't had any feedback about disruptions. It's a beta test, so we expect there may be some hiccups along the way. And we'll, watch, we'll watch that carefully. We're just delighted that people are out there getting what they want and not tweeting as much. 
So, I'm sure you're thinking the exact same thing as me. It's like, hmm, that's awfully convenient given that you have basically dismissed the idea out of hand and use it as a chance to basically blow the trumpet of how great the PS4 was. You know, if you were working on it, you could have just said that. You could have been like, hey, uh, this is something we're going to have in the future. We don't have a date for you yet. Please let us work on it. That's all you had to say if this was the case. But instead you made comments like this. Quote, on cross-platform, our way of thinking is always that PlayStation is the best, best place to play. Fortnite, I believe, partnered with PlayStation 4 is the best experience for users. That's our belief. But actually, we already opened some games as cross-platform with PC and some others. So we decided to based on what is the best user experience. That is our way of thinking of cross-platform. Hmm. Doesn't really line up with what Sean Maiden just said now, does it? And not the comments that Sony made near the start of this whole thing as well. So I'm just like, mm, okay, you just noticed that uh, your competitors are actually gaining a bit of a leg up over you, but, you know, because of your stubbornness on this and thought, hey, maybe it's something we should actually give people. Because again, if this was this is what you wanted, just some time to get your, your ducks in a row, fair enough. I don't think anyone would have been throwing their toys out of the pram at like that if you just said, hey, we're going to have it in the future, but it's just not ready yet. Cool. Great. Sign me up. But not what we got, which is pretty much the polar opposite of what we just got from Sean Lane. So while I'm happy that Sony have finally caved, I am going to call them out a little bit on this because, well, mm, how can I not? Is basically my, my question, to be honest with you. So, uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts on this one, guys. Thanks so much for watching, as always. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.